Osman Zah from BBC Radio 4. Good morning and welcome to today's programme. You will have seen and heard leading the news bulletins that an NHS commissioned review four years in the making has finally landed and it's damning. The subject, children and gender identity. The verdict, in a nutshell, doctors have been getting it wrong. According to the report's author, the paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass, there is no good evidence supporting the use of puberty blockers and hormone treatments in children who believe they are transgender. And the treatment of girls has been particularly singled out. Here's Dr Cass talking on the Today programme earlier. There has been a significant change in the population of young people over the last 10 to 15 years. So about 15 years ago, the service was seeing perhaps 50 predominantly birth registered boys in childhood. And over the last 10 years or so, it's switched to over 3,000 young people. And it's mainly birth registered girls presenting in early teens. And as you say, often with quite complex additional problems. Is this a watershed moment? You will perhaps recall the forced closure of the Tavistock Gender Identity Clinic, which formally wrapped up its operations last month. Another big moment in how we treat young people dealing with what they describe as gender identity issues. We'll get into that and the details of this long-awaited review shortly with a journalist who's been following this story in detail for years. But as we hear about how girls' lives have been affected and how girls have been treated, what is your response? Is this change in direction for NHS England something you welcome or fear? Or perhaps you aren't sure how to respond? It is worth noting that our health service's decision to give children puberty blockers has led the world and has been copied in other countries. And also to note that there will still be private clinics in this country available to those seeking some sort of treatment. You can text the programme with the number 84844 to share your views, your takes, perhaps your experiences of this. Text will be charged your standard message rate on social media at BBC Woman's Hour. Email me through the Woman's Hour website or send a message to all of us here at Woman's Hour via WhatsApp on 03700 100 444. Just watch those data charges, as I always say. Also on today's programme, a bit of Amy. A new film of her life, Back to Black, is set to be released this Friday uh, to very mixed reviews for those who've already seen it, the critics. I'm going to be joined by the woman whose brainchild it was, Alison Owen, the powerhouse British film producer. We'll hear her take. And as a new anthology is released, uh, filled with stories by women who wanted children but were never able to have them, we will hear from two of those women and also consider the merits of writing difficult things down as a form of deep catharsis. I don't know if you happen to see this study today from Japan, but researchers have found that writing down your reaction to a difficult situation in your life on a piece of paper, then shredding it, scrunching it up into a ball and chucking it into the bin can relieve some tension, some hard feelings about those those negative thoughts, those negative experiences. What is your take? How has writing perhaps played a part in you dealing with something extremely difficult indeed. 84844, the same numbers and ways to get in touch, please, if you feel you can. But first, to the long-awaited CAS review, as it's become known, which says young people have been let down by the UK's gender identity services and that it's mainly those registered girls at birth seeking treatment. In 2009, the NHS's Gender Identity Development Service treated 15 adolescent girls. By 2016, that figure increased to 1,071 compared to 426 adolescent boys, an exponential rise. You're also hearing figures there from uh, Dr Cass, who, can, who was the author of this review and the former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. She's raised concerns about other healthcare issues being overlooked in cases where young people are questioning their gender. She says that new referrals should include a screening for conditions such as autism, as well as a mental health assessment. Speaking to LBC this morning, the Prime Minister said the CAS report uh, had shone a spotlight on the issue and that doctors need to exercise extreme caution when it comes to providing gender services to young people. Is this a moment of progress or concern or somewhere for you in the middle or you aren't sure at all, but you want to learn? Let's Learn then from from someone who has been looking at this, as I said, for a number of years, the former BBC journalist Hannah Barnes, now associate editor at The New Statesman and author of Time to Think, the inside story of the collapse of the Tavistock's gender service 
in children. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's been a long-awaited review, the, the actual final report. Uh, is it as expected? Tell us, tell us what you can take so far. I think it is as expected because we've known this for a long time. We've known about the exponential increase in referrals and particularly in girls. We've known about the shift in presentation from largely prepubescent birth-registered boys to adolescent birth-registered girls who are contending with all these other difficulties that Dr Cass has said. We've known that the evidence base is very weak. And I think for those who have followed it for, for many years, there's no surprises in there, but it's quite shocking to see it laid out in such devastating and comprehensive detail. Um, and for the Prime Minister to say a spotlight has been shone, well, yes, but it's been shining in the background for a long time and really we probably should have acted along before this. Let's come to that. But the the idea that it's still shocking even for those who, who have followed this, there will be those who have not. Uh, it's right at the top of the news agenda across all papers, websites, uh, radio stations today. Um, if they just hear what we've been doing for children hasn't had the evidence, hasn't been right. What would you say to those people who don't understand how we got to this place? Well, it's difficult to comprehensively explain how and why we got to this place. But essentially what happened was quite remarkable and Dr Cass explains it. But we had a medical intervention, puberty blockers, the colloquial term for them, that at the beginning appeared to be helpful for a very, very small group of very distressed children who had had this distress about their gender identity from childhood. And this started in the Netherlands. And the idea was if you met quite stringent conditions and in a very small number of people, this might help ease that distress. And the idea was that it would give that young person time to think about what they wanted to do while the body not developing in a way that was causing more distress. Now, that all made sense on paper. But there wasn't very much data. So what the what JIDS, the Gender Identity Development Service, set out to do was to say, well, this sounds promising, but we don't really know much, so we'll do our own study. Now, it wasn't designed very well, but OK. They did their own study. But then the remarkable thing was that in 2014, without any data back from that study, they simply rolled out the early blocking of puberty for gender distressed children as routine practice. And, you know, they did that under the guidance or the oversight of NHS England. And that's quite extraordinary that. And then perhaps even more extraordinary is that a year later, two years later, for sure, the service had some results back from that, that cohort. There were only 44 children on it and they'd all by this point been on puberty blockers for a year. And those data showed that actually... They hadn't replicated the findings of the Dutch study at all. And in fact, these children weren't doing any better. In fact, some of them, their mental health was deteriorating and they were feeling worse. At that point, something should have changed because that's what evidence-based medicine is. When the evidence changes, when something you thought was true is not, then practice should change. And it didn't. And I guess that was the starting point for a sizable number of staff working in the service saying, what are we doing? And it wasn't just people getting worse. There was also this really explosion of the myth of time to think because it, it, it appeared to be the case that rather than providing time to think, it was actually cementing, it appeared to be, we don't know for sure because of the way the studies were designed, but it appeared to be cementing that gender identity because practically all of the children that went on the blocker then went on to the next stage of medical transition. So, so didn't give time to No, think. well, that, that, they didn't appear to, no. And that, that, to. that's repeated today. Uh, and the, the sort of big other elements, if you like, of this is moving away from a medicalised approach. You know, it could have been puberty blockers, it could have been something else, to a more what's being described as a holistic treatment pathway. I'm thinking of some parents this morning who may be listening who are thinking, what do I do now? What does that mean? A holistic pathway? Yes. Well, it's, it's saying we're going to treat the young person in front of us as 
a full young person because what has happened in the past is that, and, and some of this is not Jid's fault at all, but everything was seen down this lens of gender identity because the idea was that Jids would look at that aspect of a person's life and then the child would have any other difficulties assessed by child and adolescent mental health services, CAMS. But that didn't happen. CAMS were absolutely stretched beyond capacity and actually there was this real fear of dealing with someone with this magic word, gender. And, and so some of the clinicians I've spoken to say, well, it, it, it was like a cloak of mystery. This word gender gets... And everyone is scared and thinks that, oh, they're the experts, they'll do it. And, and actually, frankly, for some CAM services, it was a way of getting children off their books because they couldn't have them. So, I mean, in the last year, nearly 40,000 um, young people have experienced a wait of over two years. Yeah, it's appalling. Uh, to be seen by child and adolescent service, nearly... One million young people, according to the latest figures, were referred there. So, th- just to give a scale, yeah, of and, the and, demand, and and so not, not of this issue, excuse yeah, me, no, but of well, all support. And, and this is one of the things that, that Dr. Cass raises today that this is, it's it's a much bigger issue of a of a, a crisis in young people's mental health. And that's not to say that identifying as trans is, is a mental health issue, but but it needs to be seen in in, in this broader picture. But is that how some people may take that today, though, that identifying as trans is a mental health they issue? They may do. They may do. But but I don't think... Because, you don't, because you know, concerns about autism and mm. mental health have both been brought up. In but but I think that that's just what the evidence shows us. I mean, sadly, the data we have on, on the children, both seen and referred and not seen, who are lingering on a waiting list... It is really poor because because JIDs didn't collect it properly, and and that that's also underlined. I mean, it's been woefully inadequate, and but but what we do know is that the vast majority of those children, as well as their gender related distress, had other difficulties: depression, anxiety, eating disorders. They're all overrepresented, um, as as the researchers attached to the the cast team have said. Autism, you know, a two percent prevalence in the general population. 35%, not quite an autism diagnosis, but uh, displaying moderate to severe autistic traits in those referred to JIDs. The, now, these are these are observations. These, they're, they're measurable. And it's not to say that, and this was a classic debate, it's not to say that having other difficulties causes a trans identity. You know, some would argue that that, that trans identity and not being affirmed and not being respected for who you are triggers those other things. So I don't think you actually need to make a judgment on which way the arrow's going in terms of causality. It's how you treat. Yeah, it's how you treat. Let, let, let's listen to Dr. Cass um, in that, from that interview with the Today programme's uh, Justin Webb because he asked Dr. Cass what would happen to the children who've been told there is now no chance of accessing puberty blockers. In the first instance, NHS England has put some additional uh, resource into support local services to at least be doing an initial assessment. Is it enough, do you think? It's not about the money, it's about the workforce. And Mm. a huge part of this is we have got to help clinicians from all backgrounds realise that they do have the transferable skills to see these young people. And I know there are massive waiting lists for mental health in general, but this particular group of people has been disadvantaged compared to other similarly distressed young people. The point being, I suppose, as well, that the things that will be offered might not include or or might be uh, an effort to avoid the kind of things that would change a person's body forever. Yes, there is going to be a small number of young people for whom a medical pathway is the right pathway. And in many ways, the more we can address the wider problems for some of those young people who are not going to go on a medical pathway, the easier it will be for us to ensure that those who are going to need a medical pathway get onto that specialist track sooner rather than later. What what does that mean, a medical pathway? Well, it's talking about the different stages of medically transitioning so the first step of that has always been puberty blockers but now they're taken out now effectively yes. they're so not going to be prescribed so it'll be hormones so masculinizing so testosterone for birth registered females or feminizing estrogen for for birth registered uh, males um and i think i think what she's saying here and i think i know i know there'll be many in the trans community who are very angry today 
better evidence-based compassionate care that is catered to the individual is going to benefit everyone, both those who, who do end up transitioning and it's a, make it a safer process and for those for whom that won't be the right answer. And we know it hasn't been for some. Yeah, and and also to say, I mean, doc, there's Dr. A- Aidan Kelly, a clinical psychologist specialising in gender speaking uh, to the Guardian paper today, disputes many of the CAS findings and, and saying a German review had found puberty blockers were safe and effective. That, that those who are very much invested in this, I'll let you come back to that, but those who are very much invested in this and just trying to help somebody, a young person, may also still feel that they haven't got anywhere to turn right now. Dr. Aidan Kelly no doubt has the interests of young people at heart, but his his income relies on helping young people medically transition. He he's the director of a of a private gender clinic. So Which still exists, which I mentioned in my Yeah, so you know, he's he's entitled to his view. I mean, my understanding is that every systematic review of using puberty blockers to treat gender distressed kids, both by NICE, these updated ones, which have also fed in to the CAS review in Sweden, in Finland, and Norway have used those reviews. They've all come to the same conclusion, which is the certainty of using puberty blockers in this context, all the evidence is a very low certainty as to its clinical effectiveness and its safety. So. I, I think it's quite questionable. And, you know, Do- Dr. Kelly worked at JIS for five years. The model has been roundly criticised. The service has been shut down. It was rated inadequate. I think I would go with the opinion of Dr. Cass. He's, of course, not, not here to, to respond directly to that, but but has responded to this. So I just wanted to give the chance for you, having looked at this across the piece, to, to respond for those who are reading in perhaps more detail. Just just finally, is is this a moment, do you think? I know there's been moments, but do you, do you think it's a moment where we will now see a drop in the number of, of girls, for instance, talking on Woman's Hour, um, being uh, perhaps referred in this way or or how that that comes to be when we see those numbers? I'm not sure about the numbers. I think, I hope it will be a turning point. And I think the fact that it's on the front pages of most national newspapers from The Guardian right through to The Telegraph and The Mail shows you that this is not a culture war, a political story. It's about health care. It's about how we best care for a group of very distressed and often vulnerable children and young people who've been so badly let down. And I think it looks like there's a realisation going on across society that we've really messed up here. We've really let down these people. And if those with the right skill set are prepared to work in this area, as as Dr Cass sets out and hopes, then yes, maybe we will see those referrals go down because maybe it's just part of growing up and gender identity won't be seen as this separate thing that needs to be addressed separately, but just, just the, you know, the to and fro of growing up and being a teenager and going through puberty. Some very interesting messages to that effect, which I'll come to. But Hannah Barnes, thank you. Uh, A statement here from NHS England, who were contacted, a spokesperson said, NHS England is very grateful to Dr Cass and her team for their comprehensive work on this important review over the past four years. The NHS has made significant progress towards establishing a fundamentally different gender service for children and young people in line with earlier advice by Dr Cass and following extensive public consultation and engagement by stopping the routine use of puberty suppressing hormones and opening the first of up to eight new regional centres delivering a different model of care. We will set out a full implementation plan following careful consideration of this final report and its recommendations and the NHS is also bringing forward its systemic review of adult gender services and has written to local NHS leaders to ask them to pause offering first appointments at adult gender clinics to young people below their 18th birthday. Important to read that out in full. Um, Some messages coming in. Um, There's one here, for instance, that said, as a child, I thought I should have been born a boy. I prayed every night I would wake up a boy at puberty. I realised that wasn't going to happen and accepted who I was. I'm very happy I didn't have social media to influence me. For me, that would have been the wrong choice. Uh, Dr. Cass talks about the influence of social media on young people today in that report. Uh, Another one, my 13-year-old daughter, now trans son, 
wants to take puberty blockers. He's wanted to be a boy since age 10. He has ADHD, has been assessed for autism, but not enough characteristics have been found. He has mental health issues, depression, is under cams, uh, but has not been seen. We always have told him that taking puberty blockers is an adult decision so he can make that choice when he is an adult. Plus, we know very little about long-term issues. I'm not sure what his future holds in terms of his identity, but as a parent, it is terrifying. An anonymous message there. Thank you very much for feeling like you could get in touch on that. I'll come back to more of your messages on that and other things we're discussing in today's programme. In